welcome to the CBD Expo. Woo woo, day one. <laughs> My name is Jordan Jade. I'm the owner of Jade Healing Co., a CBD brand out of California. We're here with Rick from Thar Process. Hey. <laughs> and Stephen Horton. Stephen Horton. <laughs> Bay City Hemp Company here in Houston. There you go. I should be talking in the microphone, probably. There you go. <laughs> Tell us a little bit um, about your guys' brands. Sure. So I work for what do you do? Process, and we manufacture CO2 extraction equipment. Uh, we specialize in uh, supercritical fluids, but also we do supercritical. Is it on? There we go. Is that better? There we go. Yep. All right, so I work for Thar Process. Uh, we're based out of uh, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Uh, we specialize in supercritical extraction. Uh, we also just recently launched a line of supercritical chromatography equipment. Uh, we've been in business for about the last 30 years. Um, we have some very uh, close relationships with uh, Waters um, technology or lab equipment. Um, and uh, but yeah, I'm a, I'm a sales rep uh, for, for Thar. Uh, I'm Stephen Horton. I'm the director of operations for Bayou City Hemp, and uh, we're one of Texas's first uh, processors. Um, we're trying to integrate ourselves to where, you know, all the farmers are basically coming to us for their processing within Texas. Um, although right now we are uh, processing hemp from Colorado as well. Um, but, you know, basically we go from extraction um, to distillation um, to isolation. Um, we use chromatography as well. We use liquid chromatography, which uh, is a little different version of chromatography uh, than you use. I would say it's a little cruder, um, but um, we'll touch on those differences. Yeah, <laughs> but uh, but yeah, we make a, a wide wide variety of uh, products, you know, including CBD oil, uh, isolate. Um, we have a remedi remediated product, a broad spectrum, full spectrum, and um, we also do Delta Eight as well. Um, and we're working on our CBN as, at the moment. Awesome. So really briefly, so our topic today is what are all the differences? So you think you can CBD. There's hemp derived, there's cannabis derived, there's full spectrum, broad, broad spectrum, isolate. We're all at a CBD expo, so I think we're all fairly familiar with those terms. But just really briefly, can you guys touch on what the differences are and how you extract them differently? How you come up with these different types of CBD? Um, sure. So, um, really it's all cannabis. Um, there is the hemp derived cannabis and then there's the cannabis derived cannabis, I guess right. you'd say. Um, <laughs> but all of it comes from the cannabis sativa, uh, species, um, as far as hemp and then, uh, cannabis derived, actually there's the cannabis indica, which is located out of the Hindu Kush mountains. Um, and then there's the cannabis sativa, which, um, is more tropical. Um, so that's where you're getting those strains from. The hemp strain is actually derived from that tropical strain. Um, and then it was basically used for fiber. And now we're kind of turning it into something that, uh, you know, you can extract CBD as well as fiber because of its low THC com content. Um, but I would say, you know, the main differences come down to THC content at the moment. And, um, you know, you were talking earlier, maybe you could expand about, you know, the crossbreeding and and why that's carbon dioxide do you guys use liquid chromatography do you use steam distillation sure. what so do you do we actually both use uh, supercritical co2 as our primary extraction methodology uh, one of the reasons that i personally like uh, co2 as an extraction method is number one it's clean it's safe and it's pure. Uh, the nice thing about CO2 is that there's absolutely no residual solvent left over in your final products after extraction. Um, and one of the nice things about you know the equipment technology that we can use is that we can actually do a first pass where we're actually able to get to get in the high 70s, low 80s, uh, without the need for winterization or post processing. So you're actually your time from extraction to to market is much quicker than having to go through and do all those additional post processing steps, which require you know winterization. Uh, distillation um, and you know other remediation and stuff like that but uh, yeah I employ uh, CO2 as, as well as I know you guys do yeah too as we well. use CO2 as well um, we actually um, have a different version yours can go to a, a first pass you know right off the bat we actually have to do filtration uh, or winterization and filtration and distillation um, as a post-processing step um, which obviously is an advantage to your machine um, but you know it I would say that in the end, we're getting a pretty similar product.
vaccines, um, IPA or isopropyl alcohol. Uh, I mean, there's there's any number of ways to skin the cat, I guess, and, and pull out your oils and your uh, and your cannabinoids from the plant. It's really up to the individual and, and how they want to approach their their business uh, in their in their methodology for extraction. You know, a lot of people that will will employ um, CO2 do it for specific reasons, and people who do ethanol do it for sheer scale and and capability of doing a lot of throughput through you know in any given day. And then of course hydrocarbons is a very low entry point as far as a cost uh, you know uh, for doing extraction. There's a lot of there's also a lot of inherent danger in that, True, um, and you have is. to have a, a a class one div one uh, yep. setup in order to do that type of extraction, which is you have to, uh, you know, there's a lot of regulation as far as getting with the fire department and making sure everything's explosion proof. And it's, it's a lot of, uh, upfront costs more so. Yeah, and that's what you know. I allude to it's it's really about your business plan and how you want to approach your product and what you want to pass on to your customers. Um, so there's there's really no wrong way to do it, and I, I wouldn't stand up here and say that you know you're bad for doing it one way or another. It's just how you choose to do it and how you approach your business and what you choose to to provide to your customers. So CO2 is the gold standard. <laughs> so, you know, every, every methodology has its positives and its, and its drawbacks. I personally, I like CO2, as I said before, because it's clean, it's safe, and it's pure. You're not going to have to worry about explosions. You don't have to worry about C1, D1. Uh, you, you, know, you also, even with ethanol, you have to have a large stockpile of ethanol to do all these extractions. Sure. And, you know, that also in, uh, inherently has fire danger to it. It does, and you know, you have to have permits for storage, and there's a lot of other things that go along with, you know, doing the other extraction methodologies, uh, including, you know, looking at your run rate and cost of what your, uh, you know, your, your, your solvent costs are for the year, stuff like that. So there's a lot of business decisions, decisions that go into your methodologies, so. So what are the struggles or drawbacks with CO2? Is it just more costly? So from an up, Front perspective, yes, the machine is a little bit more expensive, um, but run rate, um, your solvent costs are, are very minimal. CO2 is about 24 cents per pound, um, for a, and you use just a handful of pounds per run, and so it, it's very cheap on the on the run rate going you know throughout the year. Um, but you know, the, the one thing about CO2 is that it's always kind of been seen as an antiquated older technology that still requires a lot of post-processing and so you're not really making much of a difference or an impact but mm. that's the old technology and the stuff that we're able to do now being able to do a first pass on a, on a biomass and not have to do winterization or post-processing so you're shortening that time to market is really I think a game changer as far as the CO2 goes and that's why you know, that's one of the reasons why I enjoy CO2 so much more and also it's 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 passing on that benefit to the customer because you're not you're not riddling it with uh, a solvent, which you know most of hydrocarbon or ethanol are both organic uh, solvents, and so they leave trace amounts in the final product. Whereas with CO2, you it just off gases like a like a soda going flat, and so there's there's absolutely nef nothing left over. And at that point in time, I mean, you really can you know you add some terpenes back, and you can really call that a full spectrum because you know every cannabinoid is present at that point in time. And you know part of this panel discussion today is you know. Um, the difference is between full spectrum versus broad spectrum versus isolate, and I really think that number one, I mean, all cannabinoids are important. Um, you know, there's over a hundred of them in the plant, and we don't know what all of them do. And so, you know, I think that you know it's really imperative to have all of them present to have the most pharmacological bene benefit and efficacy. So, um, yeah, I was I was actually going to add on about the ethanol thing. Um, you know, CO2 is a lot cheaper. One of the things that makes ethanol so expensive is that it's taxed um, when it's consumable ethanol. Um, and so to get around this, a lot of people are actually using denatured alcohol in their uh, extraction, which has things like heptane in it, which is not preferable. So that's kind of why CO2 ends up being a lot better option, not just you know, there's more upfront cost in the machine, but down the line, your CO2 costs are cheaper and you're not exposing your product to um, you know, heptane and all these other nasty chemicals that come along with this dena denatured alcohol. Mm -hmm. Sure. Absolutely. So consumers, of course, want the cleanest product. Absolutely. How, how can consumers know or identify which 
brands to look for, which products to look for, which ones have CO2 extraction? How can we identify that? Sure. So, so most uh, states now require, I mean, well, the nice thing about the marketplace is that as it matures, the, the connoisseurship of the individual uh, improves as well. And people right. want to know where their products are coming from. And I think There's that's... There's more information available yeah, to exactly. the public. And, and people want to know how it was extracted, where it came from. Uh, the traceability aspect, I think, is very important going forward. And, Absolutely. you know, in Colorado, uh, in California as well, it's, it's, uh, it's a mandate that they have to place on their products how a product was extracted, where the, whether it was hydrocarbons, CO2, ethanol, that has to be labeled on the, on the product. And I think, you know, as far as compliance and, and things going forward in the future, I think that'll be something that, uh, you know, is, is mandated as far as, uh, right. you know, what's, what's required on labeling. And so I think, you know, I think in the future, or I think, you know, as a consumer, the best way to, to you know, choose a quality product is to, you know, ask the vendor or ask the, you know, people, if you know them or if they have the information available, how it's been extracted, where it's come from, and you know what their what their methodologies are. And uh, what I've seen, and what we actually do, which I think is great, is um, provide a QR code on our products so that yes. you can then take them and look at the COA and where it came from, and actually, you know, the consumer can then you know kind of determine um, the authenticity of that product based upon analysis and extraction method. Right. Yeah, my brand uses QR codes, and you can just go right there and see all the COAs. That's great. See and you can, that you know, CO2 you, extracted. Sure, I, I was going to say, what, how, how is CO2. That, uh, you already know. <laughs> this turned into a CO2 panel what, all of a sudden. Um, what like, other, so other, things, other things to take a look at, though, on those uh, testing, though, is pesticides as well as heavy metals. Uh, heavy metals have come in recently, and it's... It's really important, you know, to make sure that you're not containing arsenic and other cadmium, and cadmium, yeah. lead, all these heavy metals. And sometimes what happens, and as a grower, I've seen this happen, is um, um, people will spray kelp or things like that, that um, basically a, kelp is a, a bottom feeding plant and our waters are now containing more amounts of heavy metals. So as you spray kelp on there, you're actually increasing the amount of heavy metals in your plant, which then gets extracted and can come out if, if you're not getting proper testing on, um, on your biomass before it comes into your facility. You guys have any other challenges with chromatography or liquid chromatography in general? Um, so I'll, I'll kind of lead into his talk. Um, liquid chromatography um, is a little bit of a pain um, and basically there's a lot of solvent recovery that goes with it but chromatography in general is used because we want to separate out THC or other cannabinoids um, of interest mainly now it's being used for remediation so we have plant material that comes in at 0.3 percent we extract it and now it's at 3 percent THC instead of that 0.3 and so now we got to get it back down to 0.3 percent and so that the way that we do that is through chromatography and it's THC remediation um, there's also other methods of degradation, but chromatography, I would say, is probably the most popular, uh, most scalable option. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and so, you know, one of the inherent downfalls of liquid chromatography is that after you push the solvent through with your cannabinoids in it through a column, um, you have to then remove the solvent um, in order to get it below acceptable levels. Um, and so... It, it's a lot of road evapping, it's a lot of falling film, it's, it's a lot of solvent recovery that takes time and from a business aspect it's, it's pretty intensive and um, you guys actually have a pretty good solution yeah, for that. Yeah, so Thar recently uh, came out with a supercritical chromatography machine uh, which allows you the ability to use supercritical CO2 uh, rather than a heptane, hexane, pentane uh, that's typically used in an HPLC uh, platform uh, for um, isolation and, and uh, fractionation of cannabinoids. Uh, so it's kind of a, it's a really neat new technology by no stretch of the imagination is, is uh, you know, uh, chromatography, a, a new technology, but this is kind of a, uh, uh, it's a neat spin on it and it allows you the ability to really get in there and, um, you know, separate out those cannabinoids and, and have clean fraction, clean cuts with a, with a clean solvent, quote unquote, with CO2. So, um, so yeah, it's a really neat new technology that we've been, uh, we've recently come out with. So, yeah. Question? Where are we on time? I think we're like 10 minutes in.
You're the moderator. Let's hear a question. <laughs> <laughs> Let's open up to you guys for a Q&A. Does anyone have any questions? Yes, yeah, in the back. Here, I'll come down with my microphone since you're all the way back there. You in the back. Fellas, I'm oh, sorry. What, what kind of breakthroughs have you guys came through with wet extraction where you can alleviate the need for the farmer to actually have to dry the material, which then can create all kinds of problems, whether they dry it improperly or create mold. There's, you know, farm fresh or pulling it straight out of the field, your moisture content's typically going to be around 30 to 40, maybe 50 percent within the plant. Um, you know, the, as far as, um, you know, extraction methodologies, the, the most common that you'll see there is going to be a hydrocarbon because that handles the, the, the water the best. Uh, ethanol, I mean, if you, if you do a, a wet extraction, uh, whether it's cryo or, or, or room temp, um, you're still going to pull a lot of that water in, which then needs to be sieved out and you'll have to... Uh, do your own cleaning on that. Um, CO2 and, and water just don't mix, so uh, that's not really a, a good option for that. Um, there are some other things that you're seeing a lot out there with freeze drying or you know uh, stuff that will pull water out relatively quickly. Uh, I've seen some pretty neat machines that uh, you know will take farm fresh um, and pull out the water within about 20, 30 minutes. Um, and it puts in a little ice cube ball to the side. It's pretty neat, but yeah, yeah to be honest, I mean, the, the best way to do a fresh frozen is going to be with uh, hydrocarbon. Um, it's just, it's just, it plays well with it just because of the polarities, um, and you're actually able to, to get a lot of that water out and separate it in a very efficient manner. The the inherent problem with that is that you have to store it cold or process it immediately, um, and so that that's why most people decide to just go ahead and dry it and. Um, you know, that's a big problem, though, because um, a lot of people don't dry it correctly or, or uh, don't really cure it the right way, uh, depending on what you want to do with it for smokable or if you're doing it for extract, you probably just want to dry it as much as possible. But, you know, if you don't dry it, then you're, you're getting mold. And, you know, that goes back to getting COAs on everything and making sure that there's no mold or yeast count before it comes into your facility um, so that, you know, you don't have to worry about getting anything you don't want in your product. Yeah, that's true. And also, I mean, you know, mold obviously is a, is a, is a big concern, the white mold that's pretty prevalent in hemp. Um, that said, you know, some methodologies allow you the ability, like CO2, to, to do a complete oxygen desiccation during, uh, during extraction, which actually kills most of, the, most of the mold in flight because there's no oxygen in there. And so you pull very few monotoxins in, and it's actually a pretty good way to deal with moldy weed. So. Nice. Cool. And yep. then th what's the, what was the process to to basically demold it? Yeah, so I mean, because it's complete oxygen desiccation in a CO2 oxygen extraction. Yeah, correct, yeah. So, desiccation just means to dry, basically. Yeah. I like that, though. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, so there's no oxygen in there, so it'll kill most of the, the mold and the spores and stuff like that so during, during the process. Put it in a controlled environment, and then you somehow, what, you suck the air out of the... Well, it's in a closed-loop system. Yeah, so w with extraction, I mean, whether it's, uh, you know, hydrocarbon, ethanol, CO2, most of them use a closed loop system, which, you know, it's a, just a completely contained um, process. And then, you know, you drop your biomass in and then start her up. And what you're telling me is this happens during the extraction, not prior to Correct, the yes. Yeah, so you could throw, you know, stuff that has a little bit of mold on it, in it on t or into a, a CO2 extractor. The, and it'll kill the mold and the spores? It, it'll kill the mold. The problem is if you have um, cytotoxins, which will not be removed, they will stick around, and you definitely don't want that in your extract, which goes back to the importance of COAs and making sure that that's not in there so to begin with. Your guys' experience with dealing with Texas biomass specifically, how much of that are you seeing? Um, I've seen it before, and we don't take it into our facility, so we don't deal with that, but a lot of Texas farmers are struggling with it. So in, it's a problem. Absolutely, it's a problem everywhere. It's 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 not the environment here. Well, that probably doesn't help it, and you know, it, people are also new to this climate or just to growing in general in Texas, growing cannabis at least in Texas, um, and you know, there's things about growing cannabis that make it prone to things like powdery mildew and boitritis that that you can avoid if you grow it the right way and if you have experience, but a lot of these people don't have experience, it's their first year, they're just getting out there, they're just trying to get a crop out and uh, you know break even, because most of them aren't making money at all. So 
you're seeing a lot of people that have never dried cannabis before and they're trying to do it and they're, they're struggling for sure. Thank you. Any other questions? Got one over here. Wanted to ask about the red kelp. You mentioned the heavy metals. I've never heard that. We actually, I, I grow it and she sells it, uh, oil, but. I uh, would, I would, it, not all types here. of kelp. Not all types of kelp so are going to have a, heavy metals, but it, it goes back to the importance of buying, looking at your nutrients and really, a lot of times they don't even have the heavy metal on there, but if you go to a website, they'll tell you your heavy metal content. And so really be aware of that and what time you're spraying it, like before you're harvesting. Is that based, like the red kelp containing heavy metals, is that based on the extraction process? Can it be removed for better fertilizers and things like that? Is that um, maybe out of? For me, I would rather not deal with it in the first place, but I, it, it seems like CO2 would be a pretty good method for removing it. Ethanol is, gonna, ethanol is not very discriminant. It's not very selective as far as uh, extraction methodology, so it's just going to pull everything out, and especially these ones that spin, because then you're just pushing the heavy metals into your extract, um, whereas CO2 is a little more selective. Um, and you probably know more about that than I do. Yeah, I mean, you know, we have some customers that, uh, you know, claim that uh, CO2 does not solubilize heavy metals, and so they're not actually able to pull that over into their extracts. Um, that's just another inherent, you know, uh, nice thing about CO2. Any other questions? Come on over here. Get a little work out of it. We talked about this earlier, but oh, now hey, that we've got up? a couple more people on here, yeah. when do you think the concept of extraction and, you know, all of these oil-based products is going to basically plateau? I mean, how much can people really smoke? Wow, that's a that's a that's a so so that's question. A, take that one. Yeah, thanks. Um, so that's a loaded question, and yeah. you know, I think there's I don't. I don't think the, the ceiling or the top is anywhere near in sight yet. I think there's still a, a lot of, I mean, as it becomes more widely accepted, more generally used, um, you know, the marketplace has continued to grow. Um, I just think that, you know, really it comes down to, um, you know, finding good actors, good quality products, and, you know, really doing um, the individual research or at least, you know, things. So the, the one thing that, that I always think about is that, you know, we've had a moratorium on this plant for the last 50 years, right? We haven't been able to really do many studies or, or do any educational um, or even pharmaceutical applications for it. Uh, whereas, you know, now that it's become, you know, federally legal in, in some regard, now those seven or 17 year studies still have time that need to take place and, and come out to actually show you know, the true pharmacological benefit or efficacy of this plant. And I think that as those studies continue to come out, yes, the anecdotal evidence is there. It's everywhere, right? I mean, that's really why a lot of us are here is because we hear great things about CBD or, or we've had stories and we've done things or, you know, had CBD ourselves that, you know, have, have done great things for us. And so I think that once that, uh, you know, those studies come along and people, you know, it becomes much more widely adopted and stuff like that, I think that, you know, the sky's the limit for the time being. Um, and I think that there will continue to be a trend of, of positive, um, you know, affirmations coming out uh, from a scientific com community uh, here in the near future. Sure. Sure. But my question is really just down to from an economical standpoint and a business man, you know, where where do you guys on the pros of extraction seeing this go in the next three to five years as the eighteen hundred licenses that have been admitted out of the half million farmers in the state turns into hundred and fifty thousand farmers in the next two years on a million? You're 
you're, you're definitely going to see people make it and people not, and people are going to go bankrupt. Um, and that'll, the market's going to determine all that. I, I don't know. Um, I've seen it happen in Colorado. Uh, that's where I used to work. I've seen, um, you know, this glut of people going out to get licenses and grow and, and it's like the new American dream. Uh, and, and then, you know, a lot of people lose a lot of money and, um, the people that do it right, I feel like, and honestly, I feel like people that are using CO2 are going to be at a better, I'm not just this saying that either. This um, is not a CO2 panel. Um, <laughs> that, and they're not using, you know, harsh, um, things to extract with and are making a good quality product. They're going to stand out. They're going to, and, and from the growing side too, you know, not just extraction, but the people that are growing it right and doing it right, they're going to make it. And a lot of people aren't. As, and you know the other cool thing though is that um, you know as far as where this market's going I think we're gonna see a lot of people grow strains and strains that become available that have higher content of minor cannabinoids and so that's one way to leverage yourself in this kind of market is to grow your CBG strains or to grow a CBDV strain um, and really capitalize on something different rather than going CBD all the way and you know struggling with other people that are doing the same thing Try to turn me off. <laughs> I was just gonna. I see the market pivoting towards other cannabinoids as more, more clinical data and evidence and oh. studies emerge, like CBN, CBG. CBDV um, is a new one too that I think CBDA, is. CBDA, yeah. you know, all these other ones that are just starting to emerge and we're starting to learn more about and have more concrete scientific evidence on. Yeah, w one of the things I'm actually really looking forward to is is getting to know that group of scientists that are able to unlock that specific recipe of, you know, call it one part CBC, two parts CBG, one part CBN, and that treats, you know, your, your seizures or, you know, three parts CBN, two parts THC, that's great for sleep. And those recipes and those, um, you know, synergistic effects, I think will, will really open up a lot of, uh, you know, new markets for people. But I think, you know, Right now, it's kind of evident of, you know, you asked the question earlier, what's going to happen with all that biomass or what, where's, where's it all going to go, right? And I think right now we're seeing, you know, that uh, the effects of and then doing a lot of extraction. There's just a lot of oil. There's a lot of isolate out there. As, as you can tell, I mean, the prices have fallen significantly. I remember last year, selling machines against, uh, you know, the idea of, you know, anywhere from three to five grand per, per kilo of oil. And now you could buy a kilo of crude for about four or 500 bucks, even less, right? And CBD isolate right now is trending at about 400 bucks per kilo. And it's, it's just, it's a real repressed market uh, in that regard. And I think that has a lot to do with the, the fact that there is no, so the, the scientific data just hasn't caught up yet. And I think that that's part of people's trepidation is the fact that they're not sure, yeah, it works for my aunt, works for my, you know, my dog, but how does it work for me and why does it work that way for me? And I think that once we're able to unlock those, those studies and understand the pathways and understand why a full spectrum is better than a broad spectrum versus an isolate and bioavailability and how our body absorbs these things and what it does with it from there, I think that's when that pent up, um, uh, demand will start to, you know, come out. And I think until that time, we're kind of stuck in a, in a, in a limbo area. And I think that, you know, it's right now, it's really about staying the course, but also diversification and, and building a unique brand or doing something that is different than some, that, that, uh, you know, someone necessarily hasn't done before or, and granted that's getting harder and harder to do. Right. So, um, so yeah, so I think, you know, there's, It'll come. I just think that the the data needs to be there first for it to really one, take off. One thing that was touched on in an earlier uh, talk too about the data being there is there's even things that are coming out to where you know you could go and get a tongue swab and then really determine your own endocannabinoid system to really determine what is good for you as far as CBG, CBD, uh, CBDV, or whatever cannabinoid it is. I, I do not, but I'm sure if you do some Google searches, you might find some. <laughs> uh, we're actually doing 
doing some work with that, um, you know, doing individual uh, cannabinoid isolation and, and reconstitution back together to, you know, find some synergistic effects. Um, it's, you know, there's there's a number of groups doing it. UCLA has a great program right now that they're doing some stuff with that cannabis research. They have the one of the few national cannabis uh, research uh, licenses. Um, there's a couple others across the country. I know LSU and um, what's the other college in Louisiana um, are doing some studies as well. Um, but it, it's going to take time, right? And I mean, there's, I don't know, I just don't know how long we, you know, really have to wait for it. So, yeah. and clinical trials are slow. <laughs> they are. I mean, they are. But but it's good because they're measured and they're, um, you know, they're, uh, you know, they're identifiable. So, for sure. Any other questions? Go ahead. Sure, absolutely. So full spectrum is going to be um, everything that is in the plant. So whether it's, but also including terpenes. And, and uh, terpenes uh, really have a synergistic effect on what they call the entourage effect in the sense that, um, well, at least my, my belief is that the, the terpenes act as like the GPS roadmap for the cannabinoids and kind of interact and tell them where to go. Because um, in your body, you have a, a C, or you have you know, the cannabinoid receptor, CB1, CB2, and the way that they interact in, in the cannabinoids, you know, they, they have different, in essence, ports where they insert themselves. And so, um, you know, my belief is that the cannabinoids, or sorry, the, the terpenes are instrumental in helping them understand where to go. And that's why I feel that full spectrum is a much more um, robust, um, but also um, true to form of, of, a, of, a, of an extract. Go ahead. So, so no, so broad spectrum is, is going to be where they've taken out one or more cannabinoids. Typically, broad spectrum you'll see is a reduction in THC. Yeah, to get it under that 0.3% that, uh, level for, you know, legal um, uh, distribution. Um, the other... What's that? Full spectrum is under 0.3. Broad is no... Zero. So... It's, it's non-detect, so... Which is even lower, right? Which is like 0 0.05 or 0 0.005, something, something low like that. That's true. That's very true. That's very, very true. Colorado says they have broad spectrum chocolate, but all they have is CBD and CBDA, and they're calling that broad spectrum. Sure. Yeah, and that's the thing is broad spectrum really is, it's more of a constitution of, you know, one or two cannabinoids. I mean, it's, it's a reduction in, in a number of other cannabinoids. And that's one of the things like you'll see with a distillate is that, you know, it'll be really high in its CBD concentration, low THC, but it's missing a lot of the tertiary cannabinoids like your CBNs and CBGs. And so uh, when they're doing the distillation, you're focusing on that central point by using heat and, um, you know, distilling that stuff out. Um, but you're also missing a larger portion on the sides of those other cannabinoids. And so, uh, you know, I, everybody will tell you, I mean, full spectrum is obviously the, the best way to go because it has everything that's inherent in the plant, including the terpenes. Um, broad spectrum is, you know, it's, it's still good, um, but it's missing some things, right? And, and I'm of the belief that every cannabinoid is important. Um, isolate, on the other hand, is, is going to be, you know, one specific cannabinoid uh, done in a very pure, uh, precise form. So uh, the way we do isolate it at uh, THAR is, you know, we... And we're actually able to go in and hone in on those spikes and move out everything else on either side. Um, what you do there is, is you actually cut out a lot of the other, I mean, you cut out literally every other possible uh, cannabinoid in there and focus solely on that. Uh, the tough thing about isolate is that, yeah, it's, it's good for a purpose, um, but the bioavailability in our absorption rates is extremely low. Orally, it's about 16%, which is extremely low. Um, and so, you know, I typically try and stay away from the isolate things, but that's just my personal, you know, preference. Uh, there is ways of uh, making it more bioavailable by turning it into a nano emulsion. We actually have products that do that. So there, I think I feel like there is uh, a use for that, especially if you want zero THC. Let's say you. Uh, have drug tests, you work in law enforcement, mm -hmm. something like that, to where you cannot have THC, uh, you work, work as a doctor, whatever. I would think that that's where the isolate really comes into play and is important for people that can do that. And we really have a great uh, nano emulsion product made by Dr. G over here. He works with us, um, but he designed a nano emulsion to where it is more bioavailable than just putting it in your mouth. 
But I think at the end of the day, every cannabinoid is important, and that's really the, the, the main takeaway for me. You did perfect. Thank you so much for that. Yeah, no worries. Any other questions, guys? I think we're getting close to done. Yes, ma'am. This might be a question for you. <laughs> <laughs> Can you test? So we, we have a needle inside oil. Can you test its bioavailability? Well, that actually requires a more clinical study approach. That's what I thought. So we're actually on clinical studies right now with our product. So how? How are you testing bioavailability in these clinical trials? What factors and values are you looking at? Got it. That's kind of like the first study. They do it in, in They're all animal based studies? Yeah, yeah. And then eventually. If, if you need a human <laughs> part. That's just so much more time. Right, right. Yeah. Cool. Any other questions, folks? Can, I, so we're relatively new to Texas. Sure. Can you? I don't need a mic. It's okay. Um, can you talk about the flow of. Uh, I, I do. So I have customers that have machines here. So all of the above. All, yeah, all of the above. I mean, <laughs> first and foremost, splits suck. I mean, they just do. It's just a, it's an awful way to do to do business. Um, it's best to do extraction on a on a price per pound or price per output on gram or kilogram, whatever it is. Um, and then you know, having a, 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 a quote unquote a vertical alignment where you're actually doing your own cultivation, your own extraction, your own. Uh, distribution for retail or formulations and for like, products oh, and stuff like that like, typically is usually one of the better ways to go um, another you great avenue see. is also white labeling um, that's a that's a great way to get into the industry and be able to create good products but um, does that answer your question okay <laughs> um, creating your own product is probably the best way to go because you don't want to enter the wholesale market right now <laughs> yeah true cool any other questions well, thanks everyone for, for hanging out and listening to us talk. Appreciate it. Thank you. Oh.